So my name is uh, Karen Wright. I serve the college as Vice President of Institutional Advancement. And this evening for our fireside chat, we have uh, Mr. Doctor, he holds two PhDs, Dr. Raymond J. McGuire, and uh, the fireside chat will be moderated by our very own esteemed professor, Christine Cahill. But before we get started, uh, do we have any esteemed guests in the house that you should welcome and say hello to? Well, I'd like to say a thank you to my uh, School of Business faculty colleagues. Um, they've all done a wonderful job in, in supporting this event, so the faculty are, are in the back. Um, so thank you. a member of our business council that advises us in the School of Business. Thank you so much for being here. And a graduate, uh, Jessica Freeman, who works with Mark. Very nice. Thank you so much for being here. We also have our dean of the business school. Uh, uh, please stand up and say hello. <laughs> <laughs> we have our vice president, one of my colleagues in the uh, room. Kirk, if you can wave your hand and say hello. And we have two of our team members, Jennifer Tannis from the Alumni Association and Rhonda Vandor who handles corporations and foundations. I see a, a number of students and alumni in the room, so thank you so much for coming. If you'll humor me for a moment, I'd like to tell you a little bit about uh, my friend, Raymond McGuire. Uh, he has a 20-page resume, so I'm just going to highlight a little bit of um, what he does, he just got back from, is it, was it Rotterdam? Mm -hmm. right? He just flew in from Rotterdam for this occasion. So, uh, just to give you a little bit of information, in addition to being vice chairman of Citigroup and chairman of Citi's Banking, Capital Markets, and Advisory, uh, he's a member of the Institutional Clients Group Executive Committee and the Institutional Clients Group Business Practices Committee. Board, chair of several organizations. Uh, he is responsible for raising well over $600 billion in his career. Prior to joining City, Mr. McGuire was the global co-head of mergers and acquisitions at Morgan Stanley, managing director in mergers and acquisitions at Merrill Lynch, and one of the original members, I'm sorry, of Wasserman Pirelli, and Company Inc., where he became a partner managing director in 1991. He started his career in 1984 in mergers and acquisitions for the first Boston Corporation. As I said, he serves on many boards, American Museum of Natural History, Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, the City Foundation, the De La Salle Academy, where he's the chairman emeritus, the Harvard Club of New York, the Hotchkiss School, the New York City Police Foundation, the New York Presbyterian Hospital, the uh, Studio Museum of Harlem, where he's the chairman, the Whitney Museum of American Art, and he's also a member of the Cultural Affairs Advisory Committee for the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs. Um, I'm gonna skip so many of the other pages because you'll probably get a chance to learn some of this, but I'd also like to say that he was recognized by New York's Avenue Magazine as one of New York's 50 smartest and by Cranes as one of the most connected New Yorkers. Art News includes Mr. McGuire as part of its list of top 200 collectors in the world. And he was featured in Black Enterprise Magazine as one of the 100 most powerful executives in corporate America. He was on the cover of Black Enterprise Magazine as one of the most powerful blacks on Wall Street. He received his MBA and JD from Harvard Business School and Harvard Law School and an AB cum laude from Harvard College. He also attended the University of Nice, France, while on a Rotary Fellowship and has had legal experience in law firms of Skaden, Arps, Slate, Meager, Flom, as well as Patterson, Belknap, Webb, and Tyler. He received his Law of Humane Doctorate from Pratt and also a Law of Humane Doctorate from Dominican College in 2017. I'd like to introduce to you Dr. Mr. Raymond J. McGuire. Well, that's 
really impressive. So thank you very much for being here with us tonight. Uh, Carrie mentioned you're a Harvard man. And several of our students had um, expressed the thought of, well, we're not quite Harvard. What can a Harvard grad tell us as stack students? Obviously, we're a small liberal arts college, um, not necessarily the, the name that Harvard has. Um, but you've got some similar backgrounds to some of our students. Maybe you want to share that with our students? Uh, first, I am delighted to be here, notwithstanding me not quite understanding on what continent I uh, am now. <laughs> I'm delighted to be here. Uh, as I look out, I see an air of formality, which really should not exist. You guys got to relax a little bit. You're sitting here all very attentive. And just relax. And, uh, let me tell you the rules of engagement. You all get to ask me questions, but then I get to ask you questions. If you don't ask me questions, I get to ask you questions. So I really encourage you to ask me questions. <laughs> Otherwise, you know, what happens in an audience like this when you don't have that eye-to-eye -eye contact, and even if you do, sometimes people kind of blaze away and they go to their iPhones, or I would say Blackberries, but no one in here knows what a Blackberry is. So you go to their Android or your iPhone, and then I make eye-to-eye -eye contact, and people look at their loafers to see whether or not they're tied. Don't worry about that. It's less engaged. Harvard, uh, it is a great. It, it wasn't as a great experience. What I've learned over the course of time is that I'm less wed to uh, that experience and more wed to an academic experience, a learning experience, holistically. Uh, I wouldn't say that because you don't go to Harvard that that puts you in a certain category. I think because you go to Harvard, that puts you uh, in a certain framework, a certain mindset, and it gives you certain relationships, but that is not exclusive to Harvard. Uh, I would take as much pride as being a student here and being a graduate here as I would uh, coming from any one of the colleges and universities in which your students take a lot of, a lot of pride. The work that, that people do here is equally as difficult. The commitment of the faculty is equally as passionate. Uh, the challenges of being a student are similar to, if not identical, uh, to what happens here relative to what happens on Harvard's campus. So while I have the fortune of having gone to Harvard, I also have the fortune of recognizing through my history of interacting with people from all walks of life, that uh, there are many other experiences that are rich and that enable students to go and compete and be citizens of the world and make a difference. So uh, I guess how I think about Harvard relative on a relative basis. I don't discount the absolute experience of having uh, grown up at Harvard and at Cambridge. I don't discount that, but I also don't discount other experiences that are not the Harvard experience that are equally as rich and equally as meaningful and contribute as much as any other institution. Well, let me take you back to a time when you were uh, very much like these students when you, are, when you were at Harvard and facing the, the pressures that the students are facing today. What were some um, Pressure. I, this word, I don't know that I ever visited this word of pressure until I got out of, well, I mean, maybe during finals. Maybe that's, that's when I experienced pressure. But otherwise, I look back A few of these kids are it. taking a test for me tomorrow, so they Pardon? Feel a little If somebody's taking a test tomorrow, then I, I listen, I, the fact that you're here listening to this, I take notes, maybe she'll ask a question on something after the year. Otherwise, you're kind of done unless you're going to do it all night or so. I, that's where I felt the pressure. It was, you know, freshman, and not freshman, but but finals week, and then actually taking the finals up to that point, I had a great time. College was a great time. Uh, I did everything that a teenager would want to do, and I, I think if I look back on college, I have limited regrets of things that I didn't do. So uh, it's an extraordinary time. It is probably the only time that bridges uh, being responsible and irresponsible. <laughs> <laughs> Over time, you, 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 know, you get to the responsible phase of your life, uh, and this is, a, this, is a, this is a time where you learn. You learn about yourself, 
You learn about how you take on responsibility. You learn how to interact with others. You learn respect. Um, all those things happen in this laboratory. And I would encourage you to get as much out of this as you possibly can. Uh, there is not another time in your life, unless you go to graduate school, and some people are perpetual students, if you go to graduate school, but that's a different experience. That is not, that's not a humanities experience, if you will. That is much more of a professional, pre-professional experience. Mm -hmm. So while you were at Harvard, you get to watch the Celtics play? Did I do what? Watch the Celtics? Watch the Boston Celtics play? I watched the Sixers play. Is that right? I watched the 76ers play, yeah. yeah. They played the Celtics. It was, it was a, <laughs> the Celtics Sixers or the Celtics Lakers. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, Sox? I respected the Celtics. I, you know, I respect the Celtics. I can't tell you it was my favorite team, but I, I respect the Celtics. They, they've won more championships than any other team in the history of the game. And Bill Russell's one of the great players. And Sam Jones and Sat Sanders. And you know, I mean, there's some great teams. So in my research, I found that you were an excellent sportsman, served as school president and captain of the basketball team, 28 points per game, you described as a smooth, lethal jump shot. I had a jumper. I had a <laughs> <laughs> there, was a, there was a great basketball player uh, at Purdue University. None of you oh. will know anything about this. Wait a minute. Uh, I'm an Indiana girl. You, gotta you are. With the they team. had a great basketball player there named Rick Mount. And the great thing about Rick Mount is he never saw a slump he couldn't shoot out of. So, uh, which means he never saw a shot that he shouldn't take. And I figured when I got to the gym and close to the locker room, I could make it. So I, I had no fear in shooting. <laughs> that so sounds I, like I you made your share. Pardon, yeah, no, I, I love the game. I still um, play it. My, uh, my, I just said, this is by the way, uh, our 18-year-old, uh, our is the number one ranked point guard, high school point guard in the country, and the last ESPN ranking. Yes. yes. Last ESPN ranking, uh, he was number two overall in the country. After so. after Ray and I spoke, I uh, used a little Google machine and looked him up, and uh, yeah, he's uh, he's going places. My my better three quarters, who's my wife, has done. An extraordinary job at uh, raising our children. In addition to having her own career. So, it's so what would you um, recommend for these students? Because I'm looking out here and many of our students are student athletes. So you were one. I was a student athlete. Uh, just by the way, I have all this Wall Street stuff, which I'm uh, quite proud of. But I didn't start this one to get into investment banking. I, I, those were, I knew nothing about investment banking. There was nobody in my neighborhood who, who did investment banking, at least the way investment banking is now described. Uh, I majored in English and American literature, so I had a very different background than most people who are now coming to Wall Street. Many people come to Wall Street, not most, but uh, student athlete, yes. I, uh, when I uh, arrived at at uh, college, I was going to be one of two things. I was going to be, and this is all based on television characters. One was a character by the name of Harry Mason. Harry Mason was a great litigator on television. The other was uh, was a uh, character by the name of Ben Casey, who was a who was a doctor. I'm so dating myself now because even if you Google this, I'm not quite certain Google has picked up on either Ben Casey or or uh, Harry Mason. So I get to, you know, freshman week, you go and ad-lib courses, so you go and you kind of try out these different courses. As I was telling the story last week when I was at my <laughs> high school, uh, I get to my first, it had to be chemistry or physics or biology, and I thought I was getting to the class early, and in fact I did get there early, but the first ten rows were populated by people just like you. Uh, and they had those multicolored pens, red, blue, <laughs> green, and black. And the professor, not to some of you, gets to the board and starts writing some kind of really sophisticated equations. And it looked like everybody in the classroom knew exactly what was taking place. I knew nothing. I couldn't translate. There was no translator. So in that moment, I figured I'm not going to be pre-med. I gave up Ben Casey and moved on to uh, Perry Mason. Perry Mason. <laughs> yeah, Perry Mason.
that's, that's law school, for those of you who don't know anything about fair nation. There's some in here who will feign they know anything about fair nation, but they do, but that's okay. So maybe you want to talk about that, that time in your life. You started, uh, I think you were a summer associate maybe at Scadden. You spent a little bit of time at some law firms. I did. Um, I, by, uh, the first year of, of, of uh, when I was in college, how do I get to law school? I told you why law school. Business school is a little different. Uh, and at law school, I applied to several law schools. Business school, I applied to one business school. The reason I applied to business school was for two reasons. One is because, uh, and I applied to Harvard Business School. The essays, there were seven or eight essays, all of which had to be about something in my journey. And since I knew how to write, I could easily uh, complete the application. And the other part was half of your grade at Harvard Business School claimed from classroom participation. Debate, if you will. I said, figure, I don't know much about this business thing, but I know I can write the essay and I'll do well in the essay. And I also know that I can go in, if half the grade is going to be in classroom participation, I can talk. And so I applied and they called me up from business school and said, you're better at Harvard Business School. And I said, thank you. I didn't actually want to go to business school because I looked over at the people who were going to business school and I thought these are just really commercial people and I was going to go save the world, so I thought. Uh, and I got into both and then I applied to the joint program and got into the joint program. Again, knew very little about business. My first summer was, first two summers were in law school, I mean in law firms. And I, uh, I split my summer between Two law firms. You can split when you're in law, law school between the East Coast and the West Coast. I split between the East Coast of Manhattan and the West Coast of Manhattan. <laughs> and I had a great time at both law firms. One was Scott and Arps, the other was Patterson Bell. And uh, so I spent two summers there. And then my summer on Wall Street was at a firm called First Boston. And they had 500 people interviewed for two summer associate slots. And I was fortunate to get one of the two slots, and that began my career on Wall Street. Well, I think that was an uh, interview that I read where you walked into the room and, and the interviewer said, you have a minute to basically sell yourself. And then the, you uh, the, the interviewer, so uh, you get an initial interview on campus, and then you get invited back. And I said, I was going to get invited back to a cocktail party at the Ritz Carlton in Boston. And so you go into these interviews, and uh, at the time the setting was a relatively sizable uh, room before you got into a large room. And so they said, welcome to the cocktail party. I said, it's great. And so I get a beer, I <laughs> flip the beer open, and, and start taking a little taste of the beer. And, and they invite me into a much larger room where there must have been, I don't know, 15 to 20 people all of whom were interviewers, and the room emptied out. There was left with one interviewer and me. And uh, he took his chair, at the back of which, and he sat straddling the chair, facing me, and he said, you got five minutes, shoot your best shot. Five minutes, or what? I mean, like, what do you want me to say? And he says, I, you know, I really don't know. You got four minutes and 45 seconds. I'm thinking this man is all up in my grill. This is not gonna work this way. And so uh, my response was uh, Harvard College, Harvard Law School, Harvard Business School pride themselves on taking the cream of the crop. I pride myself on being the film off the top of the cream. <laughs> so, okay. I mean, I mean, who could think of anything like that, and let alone say anything like that today? I certainly. But then he said, "Okay, you got you know you got about three and a half minutes to go. Um, we got 500." people here, half the class, interviewing two slots, why you? And I said, well, in the heat of battle, it is much better to have me on your side than to have me against you, because I'll find out a way to win. And so I, I hit the lotto, and I was one of the two people who got uh, one of the positions on Wall Street that, that summer at that firm from Harvard. So I, I lucked out. <laughs> so you've obviously had a lot of academic and professional success. And um, a, a quote that you hear often is, A students work for B students at companies founded by the C students. And then there's a little twist on that one, that the D students are the ones that dedicate the buildings. 
What's your thought on academic success translating to career success? There's not a, well, let me put it this way. I, I would, first and foremost, I think it's important to apply yourself. Each of you clearly has a capacity, otherwise you wouldn't be here. Apply yourself so that you can meet, if not exceed, the highest academic standards. I, there's no discount to that. There's no reason why you shouldn't apply yourself. There's no reason why you shouldn't be able to get the best out of you, because you certainly have the capacity to do that. So first and foremost, I will highlight academic success, which then gets you on a certain trajectory, without which you're going to have to overcome and explain. I have a number of people who come come in that I, that I, I don't know how many people have been forced to interview. But the answer to a subpar resume is, you know, this doesn't reflect my talent. It's all very interesting, but it's the only metric that I have. So, uh, and there may be other things that will distinguish you, but the thing that gets you into the conversation most immediately is your academic success. So I would say apply yourself to that. I don't, I, that, that for me is, is something that allows you to be in the conversation early without being defensive about why it doesn't reflect your talent. Now, achieving the highest academic uh, achievement doesn't, doesn't directly translate into uh, success otherwise, but it certainly gets you in the conversation. It gets you the opportunity that you otherwise might not have. So I would underscore the importance of doing well academically. I, cannot, I can't discount that at all. I'd underscore that. I would underscore also as part of that the what you ne don't necessarily have at the larger schools what you do have here, and that's the proximity to the faculty. You have some of the best faculty on the planet, and why wouldn't you access that faculty? Because they've gone through, they understand the world of academics, they understand the material, they put together the curriculum. And it's there for you to be able to absorb as much as you possibly can. You have an enormous capacity to absorb that. So I would say lean in heavily on, on your teachers. Uh, academic success gets you into the conversation early. It in no way guarantees continued success. One of the things that you haven't highlighted, which is critical going forward, is relationships. Um, and yes, I was a student athlete and uh, played basketball for Harvard, but decided that had I continued solely on an athletic route, <coughs> I would have missed out on much of my college experience. And that college experience not only included athletics, it included uh, the Institute of, of uh, Politics, which is political, it included social clubs, uh, that were both predominantly white and predominantly black, so I was able to go across the cultural landscape of the school. It allows you over time to develop a, a network of relationships on which you can rely going forward. There's nothing, nothing, there are very few experiences, don't let me be overly dramatic, there are very few experiences where you can develop the kinds of relationships that are uh, based on transparent interactions. Very few form, forums where you can do that outside of this setting. It's an extraordinary setting where you can, and, and, and by the way, the relationships you develop here that you forge here are ones that will be life lasting. The strongest relationships that I have other than, than my immediate family and uh, are with friends whom I've known over the course of years. And those are people who knew you when you had nothing. I remember my closest friend, we didn't have a dollar between us. Not one single dollar. We're trying to put gas money into a borrowed car and you know, learning how to drive a stick shift and the car's almost on empty is not the easiest thing to do. But these are things that you, on which you can rely in later years. That's where relationships are developed. There's no other form where you're going to be able to do this as innocently and as transparently. You got nothing other than each other. Right? You're all going through shared experiences. Get to know each other. Don't just sit at the black table. Don't sit at the white table. Don't sit at the LGBTQ intersectional. Just sit everywhere. Get to know everybody. 
So you're, you're somewhat alluding to the fact that we're in a global environment with a lot of diversity. How do you think these students should develop their skills to translate into the global business environment? You know, it is, you become a citizen first, you become cross-cultural. One of the things that I did between college and graduate school was lived in Nice, France. You don't get a better experience than living in Nice, France and being cross-cultural. It is kind of the epicenter of lots of different cultures. It's, it was a fellowship, so if you have fellowships, all of you are going to have access to different fellowships. Apply to them. You know, you, the Rotary Fellowship was one that I had. One of the, it was all expenses paid, all expenses paid to the University of Nice. And in France, if you know anything about France, uh, there are different segments of the population that go on strike. Well, this segment of the population were the students. The students went on strike. <laughs> So we were in school for the first two months and then for the rest, the students were on strike, maybe just three months. That allowed me to see every museum from the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam down to the Brindisi Naval Museum and uh, dot, 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 every pub in between. <laughs> so get to know, uh, you got to be cross-cultural. Languages are really important. The languages of, of Arabic or Spanish or Chinese have to know these languages. If you don't get to know the languages, if, you, if you're not fluent, get to be somewhat conversant. We uh, explore different cultures because the things that happen, this is kind of, I look around this room, there's a mosaic here. You have a lot of different cultures represented and get to know each other. The ability to navigate in different cultural environments will enrich your experience and allow the journey that you that you pursue, allow that journey to be enriched, and allow you to, to move more facilely. Don't, don't live in a segregated world. The world now is more diverse and is more global, uh, notwithstanding some of the narrative and some of the rhetoric that is out there. You gotta be cross-cultural, you gotta be multilingual, and you can get it here. They got a big screen up there. I came in here, a big screen. I doubt that anybody in here can give me five stories that are across that, any of those headlines today on Bloomberg television. All of which have some impact on your life. All of which have some impact on your life. I would ask, I would ask, how many of you in here have read The Economist magazine? I mean, can anybody here? So, that's great. It's like the people in the back row, all of them. Were, nobody in the front row gave me The Economist. So, tell me what's on the cover of The Economist magazine. Give me some sense of there. You can travel the world through, through, uh, through interacting. I remember one of the first pieces of literature I read uh, had to be uh, Henry Fielding, Joseph Andrews, Parson Adams. He says, Parson, he says, he says, you know, I've traveled the world. He says, how could you do that? You've never been on an airplane or a boat or anything. They didn't have airplanes. He says, you know, I've traveled through literature. I, I've experienced different cultures. The world of literature gives you different cultures. It's all written. You can interact with a lot of different cultures just by sitting in that great library right there. And if that's too difficult, you know, you got books on phonics. Go and experience that. Read some poetry. Why not? Read a little Nicky Giovanni and some Rambo. Expand a little, get some Langston and some Wordsworth. Get a little Billy Shakespeare, or Big Johnny Keats, or William Cuthbert Faulkner. Tell me those people, they're just right there. They're hanging out in there. They're waiting for you to visit with them. They're open to you. They want to see you. They'll welcome you. What about your art? You're an avid art collector. Art. Art. Yeah, art. I started collecting art, I don't know, 25, 30 years ago. I knew nothing about it. Art in the neighborhood. Well, we had Jesus. We had Martin Luther King, Jr. We had uh, Kennedy, and that was that was that was that that hung on our walls. Uh, so when I uh, when I uh, started collecting art, I started collecting art because it wasn't clear to me that there were people who looked like me who collected art by artists who looked like me. And so I uh, went to what was a young emerging curator who's now one of the leading lights in the art world, and I asked her of the artists whom I should think about, she gave me a list, and 
uh, I looked at those who were part of the canon, to use a word in the academy, those people who had been recognized, those African American artists who had been recognized by, uh, by history, Western history, if you will. And so that's where I began the collection. In its turn of the 20th century, uh, with a master, the first African American to go to France and study at Les Ecoles des Beaux Arts, uh, Henry Ossawa Tanner. And so I began with Tanner as aspirational. And then I began to collect the masters of the uh, diaspora, African and African American diaspora. And those are the people whom I collect. And now the world has shifted in terms of the economics of it. But they too are my friends. They hang on the walls and I know where every piece is, uh, either painting or drawing or sculpture. I think maybe it's time to open it up to sure, the whatever. students. We're open. I think we've touched on a lot of uh, topics, but maybe the students want to. We're open to anything. There's not a question that you can't <laughs> ask. So this is that I'm not going to. If I don't know the answer, I'll, I'll, I won't make it up. But I'll be able to respond to it. What's on your mind? Yes. Um, what are Does some everyone know you? Does everyone know me? Do they know you? Probably not. Pardon? <laughs> um, I'm your, your, your classmates may not know you. What's your name? Isabella Diaz. Hi, I'm, Isabella Diaz. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm great. And Isabella's not going to tell you, but she was one member of our Fed Challenge team that just competed in the Fed Challenge down on Wall Street last week, and the team did amazingly well. Wow, a that's impressive. Scenario. Yeah. <laughs> Question. Um, what are some common attributes of your top performers? Great question. Common attributes of top performers, uh, they are technically very good, for one. So they have a, a raw skill set that is, uh, and each of you, as I look around this room, sine qua non, you have to be technically sound. Technically good. Um, and then you have to have a, a re at the early stages, a real command of detail. And you have to demonstrate some initiative. You have to take the initiative, which means there is an assignment uh, that's given you, and you should understand the framework of that assignment and be able to address the technical details of that and then be able to expand the scope of the assignment. What I see people doing who are the most effective, and I'm going to go from the early stages of, of of the career to the later stages. The technicals are throughout. Then what happens is that you need to be able to develop or have skill set, communication skills. You have to have a presence. Right? So when you walk into a room, you can't just kind of slink down, uh, you know, kind of be shy about being there. You gotta own the room. Right? You got some game, right? So you got some game, you come with some game, you gotta show you got a little game. Now, don't go perpetrate, right? You, you got to make sure that when you're talking, you know what you're talking about. And that's going to distinguish you. So one skill set, two presentation skills. One of the things that happened early in my career is I thought I could really, you know, give a presentation. And I was pretty liquid. Uh, then you see yourself giving a presentation. You see yourself being videotaped, and you figure, this is, this is like, really bad. Like, I'm throwing out a lot of BS here, and it sounds good. But then the, as I get to the first two questions, and below that, I it's like, I'm... Uh, I don't really, I haven't prepared. So you stay at the surface, and when you stay at the surface, relatively quickly you're going to get called out. So I would say be prepared, uh, do the extra work, and the extra work will always distinguish you. Then you're going to have to be able to deliver that in an impactful way. And how do you go about doing that? Take notes of people who, who have impacted you. Uh, and ask why. There are artists who impact you. There are leaders who impact you. Just take notes. And I took notes over time from two people who had very different styles. Joe Perel and Bruce Wasserstein, very different styles. But I took notes from their style and other style. And then over time, you develop your own style. You're not going to do that early on. But you're going to be pretty, pretty frightened, pretty anxious. I sat in a room as an associate. I, you know, I'm backed by three big degrees. 
I'm sitting in this room, the CEO comes to me and he says, he's going around the room and I did all the work. He gets to me, he says, Ray, what do you think? And I'm just looking around and thinking, who's he talking to? <laughs> just, he's talking to me. You're talking to me? You want me to tell you anything? I'm just like a lowly associate. You can't possibly think I got something to contribute. He says, yeah, what do you think? And then after you, after you finish swallowing your words and kind of your, your, you moderate your pulse rate, which is now shot up to near cardiac arrest. <laughs> Once you've done that, then you can contribute something. And that comes over time. It's not going to be immediate. I would say uh, practice by giving presentations. Uh, practice in the mirror. Whatever presentation you give, read it aloud. Figure out just how dumb it sounds, and then go back and refine it. They sounded all dumb to me, so I figured I could better go refine this. So now, whenever I'm speaking publicly, I kind of go through and and uh, I write my own material, and I read it. I go through like I'm making a presentation, figure out where it works and where it doesn't. Inject a little humor into it too. Right? I mean, don't be so serious that you take yourself. I don't I, listen. I take my job seriously. I don't necessarily know I take myself doing this that seriously. So you got to have some perspective. That's a roundabout way, and I give you a lot of factors that go into that. But it hopefully creates an image of what you need to do and to be in order to have an impact. Because I'm assuming that anybody who gets to a certain level has had a technical skill set. And then the distinction comes in how you can deliver that and what kind of impact you can have. In my business, which is a service business, I need to have impact on clients. And there are a whole bunch of people who are trying to have a similar impact on that client. And how do I distinguish that? It comes through knowing the material. It comes through preparation. It comes through uh, a confidence level that is not arrogant, but it's confident. You got to have a little swagger, right? You got to have a little swagger in the mix. That just helps you out a little bit. Anybody who's really proficient, whom any of us respects, got some swagger, some game about it. Some musician who, whose music to, uh, you listen to on a, on a consistent basis got something in the lyrics that moves you. And same thing about that. Don't don't overhype what this is. It's a street game. Same thing. Happens in the neighborhood, happens in the boardroom. You got some impact on the wire, you have some impact on the boardroom. You don't, you won't. I've, I've read an interview that you gave that, that kind of answered that question a bit, but you also mentioned integrity. You, you said that, you thought that was something that. Yeah, you know, I gotta tell you, there is. Uh, <clears throat> You can't value integrity. There's no value on that. Neither that, that there's, I remember some of the questions they used to have in the year interviews, and they put questions like integrity and that, and there's a scale of one to five. I, it, it's one end or the other. I don't. I can't expand that. There's right and wrong. There's no debate about right and wrong, and all too often people expand the boundaries and the definitions of right and wrong. There is none. There's a clear, clear definition. And integrity is. Integrity is unassailable. Integrity is is without reproach. Integrity is that which should define. If anything defines you, it ought to be that. When that gets called on the question, and all the rest of this stuff for me is not particularly relevant. There's no trust there. There's not been one deal that I've ever done where I've had to uh, codify it in a contract. I can do it with a handshake. And one of the things that that I would encourage you to pride yourself on. One of the things that I pride myself on is I always do what I say I'm going to do. Uh, and uh, I've been able to recruit a number of people, a number of high-performing talent. And the reason that I've been fortunate and been able to do that is because they know that I will do what I say and I, and I will commit to their careers and they know that their careers are in their livelihoods and their families' livelihoods. I recognize that they're investing in me, and therefore, what I commit to them is being able to uphold that relationship. That only comes through integrity, and I, and I say to each recruit that what is clear to me is that they can do more homework on me than I can do on them, and I invite them to go do all the homework they want to do. And I don't, if I can't withstand the scrutiny of the marketplace, then I have come up short somewhere. But I'm absolutely confident that I can withstand the scrutiny of the marketplace, and have, and will. Mm -hmm. Everything I've read indicates that. So, as you all conduct your, it's not worth it. It is just not worth it. Do not ever, ever, ever compromise integrity. 
this is a long game. You may think you went on one trade, but five years from now, something's going to come up, and somebody's going to get, somebody's going to call you out, and you recognize you've compromised the one thing, the one thing that you have that uh, should be without. <coughs> Don't expand the boundaries. A lot of people expand the boundaries and free crisis, which got us into a crisis. The fallout to that, both personally and professionally, is, is uh, incalculable. You can't get it back. Other questions? Hi, how are you? Um, I was wondering if you have any regrets that maybe as students entering the business world we could learn from? Pardon? Um, any regrets that maybe as students entering the business world we can learn from? Any regrets? Yes. People entering the business world yes. can learn from? Yeah, do you personally have any regrets in your career that maybe the students I can't have, have any regrets. I, listen, I come from the neighborhood. Nobody in my neighborhood was doing any of this. My mother raised <laughs> me and my two brothers. And uh, I, that woman has been extraordinary. So do I have any regrets? No, I, this has been a blessed journey. I have no regrets. Are the things that I could have done differently? Yeah, this, this, what, this technical stuff, I could have mastered that earlier. Uh, I, was, I relied a little too heavily early, early, until I got really embarrassed on the gift of gab. This whole marketing part, which each of you will have just naturally. That's not sustainable. You've got to be prepared. You've got to know the material better than anybody else. Better than anybody else. And so the one regret is that I didn't learn that that earlier. But having been the longest standing person in my position on Wall Street, in the history of Wall Street, and the only person who looks like me doing that for that long, I, I regret her. I regret her few. Looks like I get to start asking questions. Sure. Mm -hmm. How about you? How are you? Good. How are you? What's on your mind? <clears throat> well, I had a question for you. Um, I knew you had a question. Yeah. Just wait for me to ask you. <laughs> 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 I'm just gonna you later this, yeah. right? What's your question? So, how did your past influence your ambition, like in your career? Yeah. How did my path influence my position, my my ambitions? My past is one where I had no plan B. There's no plan B. I don't, I, you know, I didn't come from a money background. I come from a treasured background. We had everything that, we had all the essentials that, that money could buy, which is all the roof over the head, the clothes, and we had everything that money could not buy. Love, honor, respect, integrity, and a will, a willpower. Faith, we had faith, which is at the essence of it all, if you will. Um, my ambitions were influenced by recognizing that my mother and grandparents had invested in me in education, and education was the only way out. Education still is one of the only ways out, but it probably is the only way out still for those who are less well educated. And so my ambitions were, uh, before I knew anything about Wall Street, was to get as much education as you can. So I, I applied to six colleges when I was in high school. I was fortunate to get in all six. And uh, it was on scholarship. I've been on scholarship since sixth grade. Sixth grade. I was on scholarship until I finished graduate school. I had so much debt. There was a concept in finance called Puerto Optimal Curve, where you write at the optimal percentage of debt in your portfolio. I talk about debt in my I had no money, so it doesn't matter. I can talk about that now. I was so far on the other side. Uh, I had a lot of debt, uh, but that was okay. I was after education, which is the only reason I decided to do the business school thing. I was going to go to law school anyway, so it was just one extra year. I didn't have money, so I was going to borrow it on anyway. So it was all about education. So my ambition were to get educated so that I would have choices. I would have opportunities. You're all about choices or opportunities, and your education allows you a, a breadth of opportunities. And it's all about that, because the opportunity is going to, and you perform with one opportunity to get it more opportunities. You're all about opportunities. Give me the opportunity to go show you what I can do. And make sure that when the opportunity comes, then you're prepared to, to leverage that opportunity. What is it, chance favors the prepared by? And the harder I work, the luckier I get. Right? All of that applies in the real world.
Hey, how you doing? Um, my my name is Danilo Gomez. Um, I was just wondering, like, who has been one of the biggest influence in your life that you have that you have a look up to that have helped you or like, guide yourself to become the successful man that you are today? You know, I, I get asked that question, and I can't tell you there's one person who I emulated. There's a value system that was given by my grandfather, who had, I think, at best a third or fourth grade education. Uh, went to work every day. State Sunday School superintendent. Uh, so I, I have a value system that's steeped in faith. And that allows me to navigate some really, really tough waters. It's not every day is an easy day. Even today, there are challenges. And certainly coming up, there were very difficult days. I left home when I was 16 years old. I came to, uh, I flew to what is now Bradley International Airport. It used to be Bradley Field. Took a Greyhound bus around by myself. And had there not been people who prayed for me, that wouldn't have turned out that well. And then I can remember. Uh, when I was in Nice, I went to I went to uh, I went to Greece, and I couldn't get into a hotel room because I was black. And they said that if any of the other inhabitants saw me, be bad for business. So I went to the Pantheon, and I went from there to to uh, I got on a plane to Cairo. I got to Cairo, Egypt. I told him I was related to Muhammad Ali. <laughs> and that was okay. I didn't speak a bit of Arabic, but that was okay. Was, Muhammad Ali, Ali, Ali. <laughs> and, to get, and then from Egypt, I went to Israel. I crossed the desert by myself on a bus with the Bedouins and drank cha tea in the desert. And then I shirouded, which was taking a taxi from a place called El Arish, which is on the Egyptian Israeli border. And I spent a week or so in Jerusalem. And these influence, these these kind of experiences influence your life. I can't tell you that I would encourage you to do that, nor would I be that comfortable with with uh, our five-year-old or sixteen-year-old or eighteen-year-old doing this today. Uh, that the, the ambitions and the emulation. It's not something that you can manufacture. It evolves over time. I've borrowed from a number of people. The first of which would be my family, my, my grandparents, my mother. And that's the foundation. That's an unshakable foundation. And then I take notes from the greats. I'll take notes from the great Bill Russell or, or Larry Bird or Magic or Biggie or Drake or Kendrick. I still get refined. The game still gets refined. You take notes from the greats out there. And hopefully it, that informs your game so that when it's your time to perform, you got a lot of tools in your toolkit, right? Because they're going to come at you a lot of different ways. You got to think about how that's going to happen. I can come to exist in Shanghai, same way I do in, in Rotterdam or Frankfurt or New York or Boston or Dayton or Roxbury or Brownsville. You got to have a latitude to go in a lot of different neighborhoods. Because once you do that, then you can you can pull experiences in. Sitting with you, I'm going to learn something about you that's going to inform me. Your journey is a rich journey. Sitting and talking to you and talking to you about what's on your iPhone and what you listen to and how that moves you is going to give me a sense of your world. And that allows me to interact with you on a basis that is on your terms, not necessarily my terms. And then we can connect and share experiences. I would encourage each of you to be able to do that. There's a lot in the music. There's a lot in the art. I reference those things because that's the, not the everyday and you've got to get out of Wall Street. What informs successes on Wall Street, my successes, is to be able to interact with a lot of people. You've got to be able to lead in the way that you lead. You've got to be able to manage, but you've got to be able to lead. And the way that you lead is to be able to come to people and interact with them on their terms, understand what motivates them, and then connect with that, that motivating, those motivating factors. And if you can do that, there's not necessarily a character that you emulate. There's a profile that you'd like to get to, and that profile is one that allows you to lead and to and to uh, be in, in, in to, to be of request by a number of different people, a number of different organizations. And once you get there, then you, it depends on how you how you what currency, how you use your currency, because you don't have a currency. How do you use that currency? How do you help others?
How are you, sir? I'm Gary Peters. Um, so is there a lesson that you uh, learned through your academic or business career that you wish you learned earlier in life? Pardon? Was there? Is there a, a lesson that you've learned through your academic or career path that you wish you learned earlier that impacted like the way you made decisions and how you developed as a person in business? How did I develop the academics or? Uh, a lesson that you've learned either <coughs> academically or in business that you wish you learned earlier on. I didn't get the last but I didn't. But you I wish, wish you learned earlier on. Wish that I'd learn earlier. Yeah, I this this uh, academically. Yeah, I I would if I had to do it over, I would still major in English and American literature. Still do that. I I you know now that you got to major in computer sciences and physics and applied math. That's very important. So maybe you major in those and still make sure that you know those guys in there, those women in there. I would say. Um, so there's a value in a liberal arts education? That Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I, I hold fast to that. Absolutely. One of the things about Harvard, you, there's no free profession. You can't take accounting or finance. <coughs> you can't. You got to go down the street to the, the, the those brainiacs down at MIT in order to get that stuff. No, you can't do any pre profession other than maybe pre med with physics and biology and chemistry. You got that. I mean, you got people walking around. Two of my roommates. Are, were and are doctors, and I can remember them putting these freaking diagrams up in the bathroom. Beta D glucose. What do I know about beta D glucose? But there's a diagram for beta D glucose that hang in that bathroom for I don't know how long. So I could probably, in my worst nightmare, put that diagram together with all those little molly, all that stuff we put together. Um, I would do liberal arts again, but I would also accent it heavily with math and computer science because I think that's the way the world is evolving. You have to be digitally literate. You have to be literate also with with literature. I, I would encourage each of you to come with two or three favorite poets or favorite authors that are yours, because that will stay with you. In addition to me, I'm wed with the 66 books. All of you know the 66 books, right? Anybody know the 66 books? Anybody know what the 66 books are? No, I don't. Really? No. I, everybody here knows what they are. You just don't know there's 66 books. It's the Bible. Huh. Right? So, so they're always with me. In addition to those 66 books, there are a few others in there that are with me also. Get to know those things. I mean, this is all about human interaction. I mean, you got to worry a little bit about whether or not robots are going to have any romantic side to them. Uh, likely not. So where's that going to come from? Where's the humanity come into this? I would say make sure that you are that you have that as part of your part of your profile. So I would say uh, humanities, yes, liberal arts. Uh, get some math and science in there because the world is so evolved towards that. I sit on the board of the Museum of Natural History and also the Museum, the board of the Studio Museum in Harlem. Two very different worlds. What comes together is the educational component. Of it. So uh, professionally, I would say make sure that you are digitally aware, uh, know about the revenue that was generated on Alibaba's Singles Day and Amazon Prime Day. Let me give you some some sense of the magnitude of that. Last year, uh, Amazon Prime Day, and you all may interact with Amazon Prime Day. They have all these big sales. They generated about a billion dollars in revenue. This is 2017. Alibaba Singles Day generated $25 billion in revenue. We did a billion on Amazon, they did $25 billion on, on uh, Alibaba, 90% of which was done on a smartphone. That's a digital stack with which you should all should have some understanding that exists there. And we need to figure out what we're doing this year. Amazon Prime Day, three and a half to four billion dollars worth of revenue. If you access the site, on occasion you got a little puppy that says system in error. This is the biggest e-commerce offering that we have in the country, system error. How do you think about the digital world, Amazon relative to Alibaba? Different population, admittedly, but the ability to facilitate that many transactions. That's true in some of that trans transactions per second. $25 billion worth of goods going into the marketplace. And oh, let's say uh, a billion of them want to get returned. Tell me the last mile between the time 
you order that at the time it arrives at your doorstep, $25 billion worth of goods and a billion return, if they had returns, how does that get back to you? What's the physical process of delivering and returning those goods? You have to know that. So you have to be aware of what's taking place digitally. So yes, while I am so focused on and so wed to a liberal arts and, and a humanities background, you also can you also have to be conversant, if not fluent, in the digital world as well. And then as it moves towards uh, artificial intelligence or robotics, you got to know you got to know that Rigetti, which is a massive quantum, which is a small quantum computing, but you got to know that it exists. What does that mean? What's just know they exist. Uh, I, I'm encouraged to see the number of hands that were raised about the economists. I'm discouraged by the hands that weren't raised. Each of you is there. I'm certain there. Are, you can get a student subscription to it. And why do I turn to that? Because it is, as in this global world, it is one that a publication that is accessible that gives you a view, and it happens weekly, gives you a view about what's taking place around the world. Arts, culture, humanities, economy, geopolitically, geoeconomically. Uh, hi, my name is Patrick Humans. Um, what's your favorite movie? My favorite movie? Yeah. It's got to be one of the Godfathers. Okay. Ooh. I was going to say risky business. You can neither pay more nor buy better. So I, I held off on that one. Why is that your favorite movie? Pardon? Why is that your favorite movie? The lessons in The Godfather are, are profound and they're applicable um, in business and in life. And if you watch all three of them, you will learn lessons of life. Now, I don't think there's other others. Are there other movie sequels like that? Mm. It's very hard to watch all three Pardon? of them, though. It's Pardon? very hard to watch all three of them because they are three hours long. <laughs> it's like, it's the Godfather. <laughs> They're like three hours long. Yeah, I on Netflix. <laughs> <laughs> about that, okay? Don't even go there. How many watch? How many y'all watch Game of Thrones? Look at that. You're talking about three hours on. How long Game of Thrones? How many episodes have there been? How many? I don't know. Lots of episodes on Game of Thrones. You're like, I got three hours. I got nine hours relative to Game of Thrones. Got 12, I don't know how many series. That's 12 hours right there. You guys binge on the weekend. Or whatever you binge. It may not be the weekend. I may have been too, too. Yeah, but I think like, that. like with, sh with shows like that, they, the way they end, they trick you to keep watching it. So like when you're watching a movie, the movie just keeps going straight for a whole three hours. And then... You might, have, yeah, you might get bored just watching the same thing for all three hours. You won't get bored with The Godfather. Have you watched it? I, I, I tried. I tried watching the first one. Oh, oh. And it was a whole three hour long. I, I got you, you don't do the ad free, right? You just go, you do ad free, because, I mean, you don't do ad free, because that. No, no, I do ad free. Straight, you yeah, go like straight. just straight. You pay then. You got to pay for ad free. So it's an hour session. I don't do ad no, I, I mean, I, no, I don't mind kind if of they interrupt me. I don't the, care. I'm working on YouTube. YouTube, no, I'm not. I'm going for it. The way I have it set up is like there's no commercial, there's no ads, there's no anything. That's my point. But how can you binge on Game of Thrones and not take three? Just watch the watch. Just watch the Godfather. Watch the Godfather. Watch the Godfather. Just watch the movie. Power through it. Just power. You'll be okay. I don't say that. I'm, I'm reiterating now it's Godfather, okay? Okay. I would say that, that yeah, I think that's that's probably that probably be it. I got some series that I like a lot. Yeah. 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 Like what? What I just I yeah I get all these series. I'm now watching. What I, I'm on these airplanes. You get to watch a lot of things on airplanes. <laughs> these are mindless things. I just watched uh, wow. the Strike Force and Hunted and Luke Cage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Last one I watched was Jack Ryan. Jack Ryan, I got Jack Ryan. I got through the series of Jack Ryan. <laughs> I, I, I got Jack Ryan. I did. I'm waiting for the second series of Jack Ryan. Yeah. Come Who's your favorite artist? My favorite artist. Yeah, singer. Singer. Uh, I like Logic. Who? Logic. Yeah. Logic. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else here listen to Logic? 
Anybody else know what who logic is? <laughs> you do. The two of you, three of you. <laughs> you know who logic is. You know who logic is. But nobody else in there knows logic. You know logic? You two know. You guys don't. Know, you guys don't listen to music. <laughs> okay. Do you know who logic is? I'm gonna learn about logic. Okay. <laughs> I'm gonna learn logic. What's your favorite movie? Uh, Step Brothers. Step I'll, I'll go with Step Brothers. I'm not mad at Step Brothers. Um, yes. What's something you do every day that makes you successful? What do I do? What's something you do on a daily basis that makes you successful? Um, I'm empathetic. Mm -hmm. I always try to put myself in somebody else's shoes and think about the world from their vantage point, even clients. So I put myself in a client's, I try to view me from a client's lens and ask whether or not I'm being impactful. If I go to what we call a pitch, and that is to try to win business, I gotta put myself in their shoes, and I've fortunately been around enough of them to be able to figure out what has impact. And I ask whether or not I have thought about, and empathy may be an incorrect choice of words, but I try to put myself in other shoes in order for me to better interact with them and to have the impact that I'd like to have. Um, you've touched upon the idea of expanding our <coughs> cultural diversity a couple times. Uh, how important do you find it that someone with such influence and leadership like you addresses current issues with cultural problems in our society? Um, I am, I've doubled down meaning I am more committed to part and culture as a result of the device of narrative that's taking place. Uh, because I've seen that as a forum where people can come together. It is the most democratic, small de de Tocqueville kind of deed that allows people to interact without partisanship, without bias. And we need to have more of that. There's, there's, we come to this, we come to this equation now, we come to this conversation now with a pretty decided view. Uh, which has allowed us to not in any way compromise. And every constructive relationship has elements of compromise. Every constructive, especially in long-term relationships, have elements of compromise. And you have, to, you have to enter into the conversation with that, and you learn that through the culture, through understanding what's worked in culture and what hasn't, through the literature, which is why I emphasize that so much. We interact and we will look at a photograph. We'll, we'll draw different conclusions from the same photograph, but we can sit and have a conversation about that. We can agree to disagree, but it moves us in a certain way. The shared experiences having been moved by a piece of art now. It may be the case that I don't know logic. It may be that case, but he knows logic. and. So I got to go listen to logic. I'll go listen to logic, and I'll I may not be able to interpret the words because most of the words being sung to I can I get to download the lyrics, and then I get a real sense of what's taking place. That then allows me to understand his perspective. If I can do that, I can. If, if he's allowed me, he just invited me into his world. Right? He wants to know a little bit about me. He's going to figure out things about me that didn't get communicated here. But he's going to say, "Oh, you know, that dude was kind of all right." He, you know, that's what he's going to walk away with this with something and so I, I try to think about something that I'm going to get from a relationship and how is my life going to be enriched what can I do to enrich others lives now this is not some mission that I'm on it's just a you, you, have, you have to as you as you as you and your way to <coughs> your conduct today is not going to include a lot of these factors but as you as you grow into a leader think about how you interact with others and how you get them people want to follow they want to be led how do you develop a followership? And that followership is making certain that you interact with people, again, on their terms. You set certain goals, and maybe they're going to do it their way. Not every, not, not, there's not one right way. There are elements of success and achievement that, from which we can all borrow. So take notes from the people who influence you. You don't have to go and have one person who does that. I don't think there's one person who's ever done that for me. But there are a series of people who I all had, for whom I had tremendous respect, and I borrowed from them. Ball, a little bit, right? It's okay. Take notes. After a while, it'll be your own style. Develop your style. Stand for something.
And when you walk out of the room, know that you sent a message, and this is a message that you sent, and asked whether or not the message that you wanted to send. So not everybody's going to receive the message that you want to send, but for the most part, if you send it the right way, on your terms, you'll be just fine. That answer your question? Thank you. I had to uh, walk across the plaza to get a 657 from Rotterdam to Schiphol Airport. I could have taken an Uber, but <coughs> I would have had to get up a little earlier. Uh, and I missed the 628, although I was there at 625, just hanging out on the train. That was this morning. Mm, Saturday morning, I got, I woke up at New York time, must have been, see it was overnight, nine o'clock, three o'clock. So I went from JFK to Amsterdam. I would get up on a, uh, normally I'd get up maybe six o'clock. Sometimes I bend, get up at 6.30. <laughs> <laughs> So all these students that are yawning when you're coming to my 1125 class, and I just woke up. <laughs> Let me, let me early, right? Yeah, for these guys. <laughs> Do you ever push the snooze button? Pardon? Do you ever push the snooze button? <coughs> Do I? The snooze, snooze button. Morning. No, you know, I have this freaking iPhone. And <laughs> they, it, it allows you to hit snooze, but I don't. I just, I try to make sure that I don't get another, if I get another half an hour in, so I kind of, I'm half awake. If I get another 15 minutes or 30 minutes, if I go past that, then the alarms, I my own <coughs> alarms go off on scrambling there. You mentioned previously having to deal with some um, problems with racial discrimination. Uh, I was just wondering if throughout your career you've ever had trouble gaining the respect of some colleagues, and if so, how you've kind of overcame that? I have problems doing what? Uh, overcoming racial discrimination. Racial career. discrimination? Have you ever that? Oh, man, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Every day. Even now? Even now. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, this is people talk about the great sociologist William Julius Wilson, who is now at Harvard, wrote a book, uh, Declining Significance of Race. Unfortunately, the race matters. Uh, it may be more, it's not a discussion that we have today. It's a necessary discussion. We don't have it today. People are a little afraid to engage in discussions on race. We are, un we are, we are in a difficult, difficult, horrific situation today on religion as a result of what just took place in Pittsburgh. Oh so we have to confront that. Uh, we have to confront the, the cold face of the ugliness of that. We also have to continue to confront the cold face of racial differences. Uh, it is my world today still, if I go to a department store, that um, I am one of two things. I'm either security or men's suits. <laughs> Invariably. Can, or actually three things. Security, men's suits, or the restroom. So I'm standing there like any other patient. patron. And security, or can you tell me where the men's room is? <laughs> or can you tell me where men's suits? <coughs> so that happens. And it used to be the case, early in my career, before I established some kind of reputation, it used to be the case um, that uh, there were no pictures, there was just a bio, and there was this guy named Ray McGuire. <laughs> when I walk into the room and look at Ray McGuire, Ray McGuire, this is not what they had in mind. Right? <laughs> They're looking for somebody who doesn't look like me. Just what happens, I'm a 6'4", 225-pound black man, so it's kind of hard to escape that. Uh, I recognize that for what it is and, and the impact it has on others, and I have to deal with it. Uh, and it's reality, it's my reality. I don't shy away from it. I recognize that uh, the old adage, which then applied in 
apply today in order to be equal, I got to be better. Just the way that, that's just the way the world works, notwithstanding how informed and educated we still have a number of uninformed, uneducated, biased people in this world, and we need to continue to educate them, notwithstanding the successes that we've had, which have been enormous. In some ways, we have retreated, we've retrenched, and this current narrative is certainly not helpful in that, in that regard. We have to confront it, we have to discuss it, we have to be open about it. Uh, don't shy away from it, especially on campus, which is a way that you can have these more constructive discussions. Get to know each other, right? One of the one of the things that you will regret if you don't avail yourselves of the richness of this community is that you haven't done that. And the ability to go in any community across communities is something that you should be able to do. And that ought to be something that you take a lot of pride in. So no logic and no Drake and no Kendrick uh, and no Tupac and no Biggie and no Steele and Crosby and <coughs> Coldplay. Have a lot of different have a lot of different tunes in your arsenal. It's going to give you the latitude to interact and interact comfortably. Yeah. Like this global is local, and it means that you should be able to interact with hopefully anybody in this city and be open to that interaction. Don't be wet to your own ideas, and there are multiple ways. The richness of this journey is, in my part, is because I've been able to interact with so many people from so many different races and religions and, and sexual preference backgrounds to enrich my life. It allows me to be very open to different ideas, and that's going to allow me to have different conversations. That allows me to participate in more conversations. It allows me to have a worldview that uh, that allows me to be in a leadership role. In a leadership role, you have to be able to interact with a number of different people. So, yeah, race matters. Keep it to that. Sexual preferences matter. Gender matters, even today. Invite the dialogue. Participate in the dialogue. Lead the dialogue. I'm Susan Hefferman. I'm a graduate almost 50 years ago. <laughs> yeah, well, I keep asking these questions as often I can here, but you graduated about 10 years ago? Yes, yeah, bless, bless you. Bless you. <laughs> hey. I got married while I was here, too. So um, my question for you is, to what extent would you say your relationships at, at home have facilitated some of your successes? Relationships at home? Starting at home first, that's the source. That's the Nile, if you will. Uh, it starts with my mother and my grandparents and my two brothers. And so that's the, that's the source on which I rely quite often. I never take a trip out of the country without calling my mother and she prays for me. It's, it's, it doesn't happen. Uh, and as for my family, uh, I, I did reference my wife as my better three quarters in addition to being the mainstay of our family. She is a, she's a writer, she's a uh, documentary film producer. She's doing three now, which is, uh, which is quite a task. And there's nothing more important than my family. And when I come home, I came home today and Leo, who's five, who's not a small kid, jumps into my arms and gives me a hug. There's nothing better than that. I, it's all worth it then. So the most important thing we have uh, is our family. And I would, I would add to that our friends. And I would highlight the friendships that get made here. Uh, as you go on this journey, that you're not going to have that many friends, that people, that many people on whom you can rely and with whom you interact without judgment. They're going to be at most five, at most five, and I'm being dramatic when I say that. There's not a large number of people. You're going to get disappointed along the way. But the people who are your ride or die will be you with you. They'll be with you always. And so that means you can do that without a filter. You interact with them. You control the vulnerabilities. They're not going to judge you. And you're not going to judge their vulnerabilities, mm -hmm. those relationships, and 
those friendships get forged here. Um, so obviously now you're like a renowned leader and everything, but would you say that you were a natural leader or you learned from your experiences and became more? Do you think you were a natural leader or do you think you learned to become a leader? It's a combination of both. Combination. Uh, I, you know, I don't, I don't read any of the books on leadership. I don't, I, it's not to say that you should. I just don't. I never have. You learn from others. You learn from the great leaders. That's, those, that's been my... That's, that's, that's been my classroom. My classroom is a classroom of teachers. As I go through, it, you know, I, I ask people, I ask the question in audiences like this, and I say, can anybody name for me the five greatest pieces of music? Can anybody name for me the last five uh, Nobel Peace Prize winners? Anybody name for me the five greatest movies ever made? Can anybody name for me the five teachers who've influenced your lives? <laughs> well, my hands go up. That makes a fundamental difference in our world. And so as I think about leadership, I think about the teachers who taught me and the lessons they taught me and how I've included those lessons every step of the way. And uh, I, I cannot overemphasize the richness of the experiences that you all are having. I cannot overemphasize that. It's not apparent to you. It's like lessons are apparent. They don't know anything, okay? We know everything. Over time, you'll learn that they were, what they were speaking was the right thing, and maybe we didn't know as much. And the teachers are committed. This is a labor of love. And I would say, absorb as much as I'll give you. And they're prepared to give you their all. That's the definition of a teacher. Well, this has been an amazing evening. Um, please. Join me in thank you. Thanks for me to you for having invited me here. Thank you. I really appreciate it. I'm honored to be here amongst you. And thank you for your preparedness and notwithstanding your support of Boston. Oh, no, I'm a Yankee fan. Well, that's not so good. I figured spending some time in Boston. <laughs> Thank you for your preparedness and, and for the depth and the sincerity of your questions. It was my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.